Sarah Kyes, welcome to the Single Track Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. So there's a lot that I want to talk about in the conversation today because we met a couple of days ago and uh, very similar to Mike Foote, actually, who I recently had on the podcast, you are involved in our sport in so many different ways, um, whether it's on the community engagement front, athlete side of things, race directing side of things. So we'll cover it all, but maybe the first place we can start is just, I'd love to get a little bit of your background in the sport, like how you got into mountain ultra trail run. Sure. Um, let's see. So I started my first, uh, ultra marathon was the Wakely dam ultra, which takes place here in the Adirondacks. It's on the Northville Placid trail. Um, and that was in, I want to say it was 2014, I think was my first. There's no aid stations for that, right? It's like a unique race. Correct. Well, there's like two, and but they're very minimal, if at all. You know, you can't expect them to be there. You know, it's like a um, volunteers hike in, miles, you know, to get there. And so I think there were two, and they did have like, I think I got like a Snickers bar or something really, you know, like that was key. <laughs> um, but that's one where you have to like, you're self-sufficient. You have to bring your own like water purification, um, which, you know, like if anyone's familiar with the Northville Placid Trail or the Adirondacks, there's a lot of water available typically. Um, but it also means that wet feet and there's that race is well known for the horse flies and deer flies that get you and they give out in their, um, uh, gear bags, like little, these little sticky things that you put on your hat or your, like the back of your pack or somewhere. And they like attract the fly. So then they land there and can't get off. <laughs> so there's all these great photos of like these, uh, little like pieces of tape basically that are covered in deer flies at the end of this, that race. But, um, so that was my first race and, uh, it went great. Um, I did really well. I ended up, you know, first female, um, and I think in the top five overall, actually, for that race. Um, but I was talked into going to it by a friend of mine, Jan Welford, who lives here and is kind of a very much a local legend. And I like to call him my sensei, sort of, or, you know, my mentor when it comes to uh, athletics. But um, he was one of the first to, you know, start going for speed records here in the Adirondacks. Um, you know, and started as a hiker and then, you know, trail run. But uh, so he yeah. had talked me into going to Wakely. And um, so that was, that was super fun. And then he also talked me into doing um, Vermont 50. So that was my first 50 miler over in Vermont. And that went, went really well also. And that was, I guess that was in, also in 2014. I can't remember now if it was 2014 or 15, but um, was a really fun event. You know, it's both a mountain bike ride and a, um, a running race. So you like are kind of going back with mountain, back and forth with mountain bikers and um, just a cool community event that's been around for a very long time. Um, and it's for Vermont adaptive. And so it's, it's just a cool, cool race. That's, it's really friendly for beginners too, because there's a lot of dirt road and, you know, some single track, but it's not like super intimidating, I guess. Um, so that's where I kind of got started. But, you know, of course, like starting here, I wasn't like, as a kid, I wasn't super competitive. I didn't really do sports. I wasn't like, you know, a typical like cross country runner or even track runner. I think when I did um, track and field, I would do discus because I was like too anxious to <laughs> line up on the start line and, and actually sprint in a like the, the sprinting races. Um, although I did do some, but uh, that's why I chose to do discus instead. And then um, when I tried out for cross country, I think I went to one practice and never went back because I was like, this is not for me <laughs> and barely could finish the mile run, you know, or whatever was the training run for the day. Um, and that was in like middle school, you know, but then after um, high school, I, I found like trail and mountain running, um, you know, after doing a little bit of traveling, I did an AmeriCorps program right out of high school and came back here and, uh, you know, and part of AmeriCorps is like physical training because it's a government based program. And so they make you run, you know, like 15 minutes or something a day. Um, and so I continued it once I got home and, and took it to the trails and to the mountains. And um, yeah, we kind of went from there. But that's kind of the, the general background. Well, one thing that I want to touch on, because I was doing a little bit of research for this show, uh, typed your name into YouTube. And there's a bunch of really cool videos. I think La Sportiva did one where you're mm. living out of your van or your truck with your yeah. dog and you're sort of traveling the country and prepare, you know, training on the road, getting ready for events. So where did that whole idea come from? And maybe talk about that experience a bit too. Sure. Um, so 
That was um, in 2017, the video that you're specifically talking about. And that kind of uh, was born from an opportunity where I was given a sponsor position for Western States in 2017 um, through Jolbo, which is one of my sponsors still. And um, yeah, so I try to like come up with a plan of, you know, how best to train for Western States, you know, without really knowing that much about it, honestly, at the time, like they offered me the, the position and I was like, yeah, of course, you know, I, I know it's a huge deal, but I didn't, didn't really know yet, you know, how big of a yeah. deal. Um, but also uh, just before that, I was um, be before the Western States thing, I actually had traveled a year before that um, out of the truck. I finished nursing school and part of that like when you finish nursing school, everybody's finding a job like immediately, you know, you want to just continue. And, but I wasn't really ready for that. I felt like I really wanted to do something different before I like took a career position. And yeah. so I started doing um, some mountain running races out West and decided I would like live out of my truck while I did it. Um, and my first truck was a, a Ford Ranger that had I had it was kind of like this really cool purple color and I found this like old truck cap off of Craigslist and it was like full of like chrysalises and like <laughs> bugs when I bought it and spray paint or spray washed it and then spray painted it like a bright pink color and so that was like what I lived out of which was super fun and um, part of that I think is is just like I, I like to talk about like the frontier you know and like yeah. going for the unknown and I think that's why some of us do these ultras to begin with um yes. and so some of that was you know like let's just go on an adventure right for four or five months <laughs> um and some of that was also doing the u.s sky running series too at that time um which was still in existence which is a cool cool series but um so then the video you're talking about was in 2017 so a couple years later uh getting ready for western states um and so i decided to do the same thing you know and, and live out of the truck and do a bunch of training runs and had some super cool experiences um you know did some some group runs with la sportiva you know at different retailers and stuff throughout the country but um i used to actually do some tech repping with sportiva too so i kind of get the whole like all aspects of uh, like brand representation from athletes to actual sales, like in brick and mortar. But um, yeah, so it was a super fun project to like, also not make it all just about Western States, you know, like sometimes when you put all of your eggs in one basket, it can be just pretty disappointing. So my thought was, why not like make a really cool adventure where I like go do a race near the Grand Canyon and like go to like Death Valley and like do all these like interesting things you know that um are like bucket list items in their own right uh before getting to western states you know making western states you know the finish line to make it there but uh not put all the pressure on it i guess one thing i'm really curious about there is the lifestyle part of it when all was said and done were you ready to be done with it or was it something you could see yourself doing for months and years on end because and i'll just say just for context like i through hiked the appalachian trail i guess it's eight years ago now and the day I finished the trail I was not ready to be done it was such a paradigm shift and yeah. I'm like I'm, I'm down with minimalism I'm down with just like you know type two fun and in like low grade exercising all day and just being in the mountains I'm curious uh what your experience was like when it was all said and done yeah for sure I think one of the coolest things is like yeah that like feeling of man, like running water is really cool. <laughs> you know, like having access to like heat whenever you want it is like, you know, should be valued, you know? And I think yes. um, we all, we lose that because it's, and it's easy to, right? Like we all have these things available to us. But uh, when you decide to like step away from that and live very minimally, right? Like, and have to cook on your tailgate every day and, you know, like make sure you have enough gas in the gas tank and enough water and, like the bare minimals, you know, things that you need to like yeah. kind of be off the grid for a week if you need to. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think I was definitely, it was also like encroaching on winter, which is a whole nother game if yes. you're trying to live out of your vehicle. But um, yeah, I think I, I could definitely do it for a long time. I, you know, my dad uh, is kind of like, does some of this stuff. He lives out of a scamp trailer have you ever seen those it's like kind of the original um like teardrop well it's not teardrop it's like a pill shaped uh toe behind yes, yes. and yes, yes, yes. uh so he has one from the 70s that he found and so he like lives in idaho in the um 
kind of summer months, but goes to Arizona for the winter. And so like does these caravan trips and lives out of his trailer and has a, has a house in Idaho, but um, you know, prefers to be like him and his dog, like living in the desert <laughs> for several months, you know, probably like at least six months out of the year, I guess he does that. And so I think I look at that as like, man, yeah. Like what, what more do you need sometimes, you know? But yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, one other thing that I want to talk about with your background is the Adirondacks and being based in the Lake Placid, uh, Saranac Lake area, because most folks that come on the show, you know, as much as I try to make it not about this, it's definitely like a mountain West biased, West coast mm -hmm. biased show in terms of like guest locations. And you're on the East coast, you're, you're in the Adirondacks and maybe give us a sense of what training and the lifestyle is like there and what the, mm -hmm. what the scene looks like in general. Sure. So um, for those who like aren't familiar with the Adirondacks, um, it's a pretty unique place. It's um, so where I am in Santa Lake is like probably an hour and a half from the Canadian border. So quite far north and then like two hours from Vermont. So pretty much like smack dab in the upper uh, part of New York state. And the Adirondacks are kind of a park you know like a national park except you can own property within it and live within it um, and there's different restrictions but it's a six million acre park that uh, so that's like Grand Canyon Yellowstone and like a couple others like put together you know so it's huge um, and then there's wilderness area that is you know so it, this happened in the 70s when the government you know they decided to protect this area um and so they created the adirondack park agency which then like sort of broke apart different land use types um and so like sanic lake and lake placid are to uh, so hamlet's are meant to center development um and you can you know then around it there's industrial land but there's also then wilderness and wetland and all these other things um and so you can right live within the park own land but then you also have restriction restrictions on what you can do with your land right like if you own wetland you, you're not developing it um so that makes it kind of unique uh and there's 46 mountains over 4,000 feet um and so our base elevation i'm at like about 1100 feet so you know, the top of New York state is Mount Marcy, um, at like 5,500. I should know exactly what it is, but I don't. <laughs> so you get pretty good, like elevation gain. And I think most folks know, like the East coast is known for being kind of burly and gnarly. And like, you know, most of our, um, trails are basically just going up. You know, like it's the, the water kind of makes the trail for you and you're taking the path of least resistance, um, uh, for trail basically. And, yeah. um, yeah, so the High Peaks region is what most people know, like the Adirondacks by pretty much. I mean, I think you could also argue a lot of folks um, come to the Adirondacks just to camp or canoe. We have um, the largest protected canoe area um, outside of like, you know, uh, the, I want to say border land, it's not borderlands, but in, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota area, there's a lot of canoeing in that region too. Um, so we have a similar kind of system like that here for canoeing and, and camping. And um, yeah, so it's an interesting, a lot of different groups. And then you have people obviously that have been born and raised here for and like generations, um, folks that, you know, the kind of like rotting gun type people, right? Like hunters and, um, and then there's hikers, snowmobilers, cross country skiers. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's, I guess, I always thought there would be some place else that would like another town somewhere that I would drive through and be like, Oh, this is the place. Like, this is where I want to be. But it always has just been here. <laughs> um, you know, with all the traveling I've done and like exploring and driving cross country, like now several times, uh, I always just end up wanting to be back in Saranac Lake. And I think some of that is, you know, the community here. Right. And like, I, I can't go to the grocery store without seeing someone I know, you know, and mm. like saying hi and, and having conversation, which is good and bad, <laughs> you know, like sometimes you just want to be in and out and not, not see someone. But um, I think there's something, you know, pretty special about that. And, you know, I think too, with mountain towns, um, you know, we all share a lot of similarities, like whether you're in Colorado or the Pacific Northwest or here, you know, like mountain towns, 
um, there's something about them, I think, that make the people kind of, uh, like, you really want to have to be here. You, like, really want to have to live here um, to be here for, for most places, you know, like, it's not, there's not a lot of, like, job opportunity. Well, now, I will say that has changed after the pandemic, with people working from home, you know, like, yeah. but, you know, like, if you live here, you're probably, like, in the service industry, which I did for you know, 15 years, um, or you're a teacher or you're a nurse and work in healthcare or, you know, there's, it's pretty, I'm curious about the trail scene specifically. Is mm -hmm. there a community there that you train with and maybe also talk about like any races in the area or because it's protected wilderness area, are there mm -hmm. limited racing options and it's mostly like FKT type stuff, for example? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's certainly changed, I think over the last decade, you know, and when I started like running in the mountains here, um there really wasn't m that many folks like it was me and my friend Jan who I mentioned earlier you know he'd be out there um and of course there were always like road runners we have a um, Lake Placid has the Ironman which is one of the oldest um I think Hawaii being the other uh oldest Ironman so um you know it there's sports here and obviously we're an Olympic town right Lake Placid's an Olympic town so there's a lot of sport going on here and there's a lot of um like road running and road cycling um and there's actually quite a good mountain bike scene here too um and so there's people out there but i wouldn't say the trail running scene um has really caught up here you know i think it's going to i think there are going to be more um you'll see more people and i do see like even through the pandemic just more hikers and so i think it'll mm. catch on you know we, mm. we saw a huge influx of like first-time hikers um in 2020 i guess right after the pandemic started um and so i think those folks you know wanted to experience it for themselves and then i think you know they'll start running as i did you know like i started hiking and then i was like oh right i could do several peaks today if i ran when i can you know i like to joke and say that mountain biking and and trail running in the like in the adirondacks is really just like fast hiking most of the time <laughs> anyway but um so yeah i think the the, the trail running scene um, has some catching up to do, you know, but at the same time, you know, I don't necessarily mind being, you know, one of a few uh, out there, I guess, running, you know, it's sort of, um, I certainly didn't get into it because I wanted to be spending time with a bunch of other people, I guess, which some of us, I think, feel that way. But, um, you know, there's something special, I guess, and, and part of the reason I got into mountain running was like, for the solitary time, you know, mm. out there, I think. Mm. Um, but that being said, like, um, my boyfriend's a uh, professional obstacle course racer. And so we train together, you know, in the high peaks and, and running mountains. And that's kind of how we met, actually, because, because, again, there's not that many people doing it. Um, but, and then we have good friends who um, will come run with us and train with us too in the high peaks. But um, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's growing, but again, it's, yeah, I wouldn't say it's like a bend or like, um, even in North Conway, you know, I think they have a, in New Hampshire, they have a bit of a stronger trail running scene there for sure. You mentioned yeah. Lake Placid being a former Olympic town. I think it was, was it the 1980 games? Are there still um, Yeah. 1980? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 1980 and 1932. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, are there any, um, are there any athletes that still train there for any specific events and you link up with them for various types of training? Yeah. So, um, like, gosh, we've put out several, um, like I grew up with several Olympic, uh, biathletes and Nordic skiers and Nordic combined, which is a crazy weird sport of like Nordic skiing and then ski jumping. <laughs> um, one of the really cool things I think about Lake Placid is that you can literally like do ski jumping after school. Like that's like your after school sport is to go to practice ski jumping. Um, and there's like probably I think just here and maybe like Park City has ski jumps from the Olympics, yeah. I think, too. Mm -hmm. So like there's very few places you could like do that sport as a child, you know, like young kids, like seven, eight years old, like going out there and learning how to ski jump. Um, but that being said, yeah, there's a Olympic training center here as well. And so in the summer months, like there's um, but the biathlon team and this, the Nordic ski team will be here to train and like do roller skiing and stuff. And so um, like over the years, I've definitely had friends that were, you know, Olympic athletes that I got to go out and run with and stuff. And um, like Corinne Malcolm, that's how her and I met, actually. She oh, was very cool. 
here training for the on the biathlon team um and that's we would go out and and run and that's how I met her so that was yeah like over a decade ago now I guess but yeah I went to sc- I went to high school with a woman Claire Egan she was on the U.S. biathlon oh, yeah. team as well yeah. I think she was training up there as well yep um, yep that's such a cool sport yeah it's really pretty interesting you know I mean it, I find it um you know like to be able to redline and ski it's such a high effort and then have to like just quiet like it's such it's all breath related I would think you know and then have to like quiet your breath down and your heart rate to like concentrate and aim a gun (laughs) right really interesting I just had had Corinne on the podcast a couple months ago and I totally forgot to ask her about Mm. the influence of biathlon on her ultra running career which I'm sure there are some things you take away from that sport oh totally and I think you know um like another friend of mine who lives here, Lindsay Webster, who's a big obstacle course racer and one of the best women um, up until this point. And so they have a second home here. And so we train with them and her and I go back and forth with like FKT projects and stuff here. But uh, she was a like in high school, a Nordic skier. Um, And actually my boyfriend was a Nordic like state champion also. Um, And so I think it does, you know, having that type of engine and being able to do that type of aerobic training, um, like consistently and on a, at like a pretty hard effort. Cause it, there's not the same pounding, you know, that you get from running. Yeah. I think it's probably huge. I would think, you know, and the more we learn about like from a cellular level, right. When like strength training or things like that, like that you started at an early age, the like benefit for adults and on is pretty huge. Yes. Yes. Well, Anyways, that's really cool. Lake Placid, cool. Yeah. I, I live right down the road from Park City. And yeah, the, the benefits of being in a post-Olympic community are incredible. Like in addition to training partners in various sports, you get like the best coaches that still hang around yeah. and facilities. And if you ever have any For sure. medical issues, the best PTs and surgeons, it's just incredible. Yeah, I feel pretty fortunate actually to have those folks available. And like a friend of mine, uh, who, my roommate actually, he's the U.S., luge uh, athletic trainer doesn't live with me anymore but that was like perfect <laughs> you know i'd be like matt i have an issue with like can you fix my ankle you know and so he could you know do his magic and it was very helpful um but yeah i think it's a huge benefit and, and you know talking about youth i think having uh those facilities available for kids and like being able to ski at Whiteface, you know as a little kid up you know to adult is pretty cool you know i think it's Again, yeah. not that many places you can like train on an Olympic mountain yeah, as your after school sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, speaking of Whiteface, uh, I, yeah, you're the race, you're the race director of the Whiteface yes. Mountain yeah. Sky Races, and um, how'd you get into race directing? Um, so, man, actually, that started a long time ago. I started putting together small events um, in Paul Smith, which is like 15 minutes from where I currently live. Um, and I was, I used to work in environmental education. And so I had a job at an outdoor center there, um, okay. basically as, you know, like doing public programming, but was getting into running myself and thought how cool, like these trails are perfect to hold a trail running event. And so, um, the couple of years that I worked there, I did put together a couple of different series of races there, um, that still happen actually, like they're still ongoing, which is pretty fun. Um, okay. but I don't really have much of a, uh, direct, uh, linkage with them anymore except for that I help start them but um yeah and so I've always just been like excited about I guess bringing people together in that way like we used to just do fun runs too like out at that outdoor center um once a week and like some of those people are still friends from meeting you know at those types of things and like still go out and run together which is really cool um but I think part of that is like what I was just saying about like trail running hasn't really taken off even you know back that like 10 I guess that was 10 years ago now, even then there was only a small handful of us that would meet at the Vic, you know, to, to do these little trail runs, you know? Um, and that's still kind of the case. Like there is a group that gets together here, I think on Tuesday nights, but it's, you know, like mostly road running and that's it. Um, yeah. so for me, I think providing those opportunities for people to put themselves out there and right. Run the 5k on the trails or, um, or, or we actually had a marathon, I guess, distance too on the trails out there, which is pretty cool. So, but like working up to it, you know? Um, so I guess it was 2015, uh, was the first year that Red Newt Racing put on the Whiteface Sky Race. 
Um, and it was part of the sky running series that I was talking about earlier um, and brought huge names, you know, um, like Stevie uh, and Kramer, yeah. Kramer and um, Casey and men, but at like Joe Gray and uh, Tom Owens yeah. and yeah. Um, who else raced that year? There was a bunch of like, like a lot, there's, you know, several. Um, and so that was the first year I was on the run steep, get high team too. Um, the era Vipa is kind of, I, I don't think they have any more. Um, they still have the line of like apparel and stuff, but he, yeah, Jamil was trying to put together a bit of a running team at that point. And I had like, just sort of reached out to him via email one day and was like, Hey, yep. like I'm from the East coast. I'm looking to get involved in trail running. Like, will you take a chance? Um, he's like, yeah, of course, this is great. And so I joined the team and we were kind of like a Solomon, like feed team. Like we were, we had all Solomon gear. Um, and so, yeah, that first white face guy race, I think I was like two minutes behind Stevie and Casey and they like finished together. Um, and it's probably still like the worst conditions I've ever raced in. It was like, it was in June, I think, but it was like, probably 35 degrees on the summit and pouring rain and just like <laughs> pretty, pretty miserable. I feel really bad for the volunteers that year. Um, but it was like a really eye opening experience. Like, Holy cow. Like I can keep up with them. You know, like I didn't know how close I was to them. I probably would have tried to push a little bit harder, but pretty cool experience to do that. Like on my home turf, you know, and like have it here. And, um, and then I raced it again the next year, I think. And then the year after that, uh, Ian, who owns Red Newt Racing, like approached yeah. me if I wanted to like kind of help out and be co RD. Um, and I thought, well, yeah, you know, heck yeah, like that way I don't have to run it <laughs> anymore because it's pretty burly. Um, and just like, you know, put my hand in the, the RD uh, stuff. So now this year we're pretty psyched because it's the US Mountain Running Championship event, which is um, awesome. You know, it's, it's been on the East Coast before, Loon Mountain, I think we. I mentioned um yeah. has had it several times so pretty cool to bring it back this way and just try to showcase white face um so it'll be yeah july 2nd this year is the race which we're super psyched one thing i got to mention there is so jamil did make a youtube video for that 2015 year and yeah. i'll link to, i'll link to it in the show notes you're, yeah. you're totally spot on about the weather. I mean, yeah. you could, there was no visibility. It was pouring rain, mud. Everyone is just like scrambling for any traction yeah. whatsoever. It's, it's gnarly. But one thing I wanted to ask you is, because I'm always trying to find ways to get folks who are on the West Coast and the Mountain West back East, what makes mm -hmm. Whiteface such a cool race in your opinion? Like what, why should somebody in Colorado, for example, who does most of their training and racing out here, put it on their schedule for say 2022 or next year yeah i mean i think um if not only because like they just should try an east coast like i think the east coast just doesn't get the respect it deserves <laughs> you know i think people just just don't know what to like they don't know what to expect and they just haven't either haven't been here or you know like yeah they've come to do one at like vermont 100 or vermont 50 that's dirt roads you know and so they have not spent the time in the high peaks or, you know, or in the white mountains, you know, it's another good example. Like people come and, you know, expect to do the presidential traverse and it like, it's deadly. That's a deadly trail at times, you know? Um, so I think coming to do white face should be in everybody's bucket list. I think it's a classic, like, um, VK route, you know, basically, um, there's the, championship route and then there will be a vk in the afternoon on the same day so you could actually do both events if you wanted to but um you know you get an amazing hopefully the weather will be good and not like that 2015 year because you never know but um the years that the weather is beautiful you get a huge view most of the high peaks you can see from the summit a high point you don't actually go all the way to the summit of white face because that's in wilderness which yeah. we could still talk about that a little bit but um yeah. so you can go to the top of the, the ski run and you get a great view you can see lake champlain you can see into vermont you can um you know, it's amazing. And then you get to like basically plummet 3000 feet back down to the base. Um, and that'll be basically the course is like a straight up and a straight down. So it's an interesting, you know, different people will have different strengths there, you know, for sure. Um, and it's a bit off trail, you know, it's going to be pretty burly. There's some nice little running sections. There's some dirt road. Um, you know, it's interesting trying to 
make a course, you know, that the USATF team is looking for. Um, you kind of want to appeal to like what the world championship that year is going to be. But at the same time, we didn't want to like downplay what white face is all about, you know? And so we kind of left, we basically said to USATF, Hey, look, like this is our mountain. It's, it's burly. It, this is what we're going to give them, you know? And they're like, okay. <laughs> so it's definitely a, uh, it's definitely, a, it's an intense, can be a pretty intense race. Yeah. Not to put you on the spot here, but we, we were just talking earlier about how, like with the Adirondacks, for example, there's a lot of protected land. Same thing with mm -hmm. the White Mountains. Same thing with a lot of the Appalachian Trail in Maine. Are there any other, and for that reason, it's really difficult to put in a lot of these longer, like 50 mile, 100K, 100 mile yeah. courses. Are there any other races, in your opinion, on the East Coast, similar to Whiteface, that would really provide that full New England, Eastern New York type mountain yeah. experience? There are, there are several actually. So like the, um, and I remember this cause I think it was on the ultra runner podcast years ago. And he asked me this question of like, if there were other races and I felt bad cause after the fact, I thought about all these other races that I was like, Oh, I should have mentioned this and this. And I kind of just was like, no, there's nothing, but there are actually lots. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so this question I've had answer for, for a long time, but, um, besides white face, um, I mean the escarpment, have you ever heard of this, that race yes, that's been going on race. very cool forever yeah it's like super historic um devil's path region down in the catskills it's um i have yet to be able to do it because it hasn't lined up with my schedule but i actually think it's in july it probably isn't long after whiteface i want to say like maybe the two weeks after potentially I don't, is the typical time frame i think but um that's a, it's a shorter distance. It's not an ultra. I think it's eight, 17, 18 miles, I want to say. But classic, like definitely should be on people's radar for sure. Um, Manitou's Revenge, that's a 50 miler down in the Catskills that's like super gnarly. Takes like, I mean, the winning time is like, I'm going to, I don't even know for sure, but I want to say like over 10 hours probably for like, okay. you know, it's like really, and the elevation gain is crazy. And it's like when I was talking earlier about like, basically you're just going down drainages like that <laughs> i think that's what you're doing there too um and then there's like um there's a couple of races like vermont has what used to be called the double up i don't know i think he changed his name though it goes like from stowe in uh, Mount yeah Mason. yeah um gnarly. and so that takes you yeah super gnarly and like takes you up to the top of mount mansfield the point in vermont um on the long trail runs like right over that as well and that's like really kind of pretty like iconic beautiful view to like be on top of mount mansfield up there um and uh also protected though i think he puts a limit on his entrance i want to yeah. say because like, of that really yeah so there is same here like they you have to apply for a permit from the state in order to hold an event in wilderness so for us like my favorite race of all time um, that I didn't mention earlier, which I thought of was the great Adirondack trail run. And that happens here in Keene Valley, real short race. It's only 11 miles um, with 3000 feet of gain and it's through um, the giant wilderness. So they have to get a permit for that. Um, and it's limited to about 70 people. Um, and so it sells out like a um, and they do this yeah. cool registration system where you have to call the store um at 8 a.m on the day <laughs> and like it fills up in like 18 minutes or something like it's super fast um but that's like a classic that actually is the race that got me into like mountain running for sure because okay. i remember the first year i did it i was like i don't think i can even finish this you know i was thinking is this too too much for me but um i was like hooked immediately after doing it and um corinne used to do that race too and some of the like you just never excuse me, you just never knew who was going to show up on the day. Like sometimes half the biathlon team would be there you know, and, and sometimes not. So it was always like good for competition, you know, and it's a, um, uh, you know, you start on single start. So everybody starts on the minute and so you don't know like where you are. You're just running as hard as you can, you know, like t against your own time, which is super fun. So uh, that's a, that should be on everybody's bucket list too, honestly, that race. And then, you know, there's always a good like barbecue afterward. And uh, okay. I used to work at a brewery that would donate the beer. And so that's how I usually got in. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good time. Cool. <laughs> um, but there's, wow. there's others. In, I want to say in, in New Hampshire too, there's, um, um, oh, I'm forgetting her name. She used to run for 
all sick. She puts on some races in that New Rock Hampshire. Hopper. Yeah, that's Rock Hopper, Hopper races. Yeah. 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 And so they have some cool events. And then um, my business partner, Hillary McCloy, her other half, Andrew, puts on a last man standing uh, running and skiing race in New Hampshire, which is pretty intense. Um, they just had their last man, last skier standing uh, a couple weeks ago. It's pretty cool. Oh my gosh! But there's yeah, so there's tons. Like once you're in, you know, like once you come over, you're like, oh yeah, there's tons of cool stuff happening. It's just yeah, and then of course Eastern Mountain States too. So there's there's the Eastern Mountain, or um, am I saying that wrong? Eastern States 100, I guess it's Eastern called. States 100, yes. Yeah. Yes, in Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah, and Pennsylvania. Oh, there's more too. So Pennsylvania, there's Heiner. Have you ever, have you heard of Heiner? Yes, that's only a through, classic. Uh, Zach Miller. Yeah, I think Zach Miller made yeah. that kind of popular here. Yeah, it's um. Well, it used to be part of the La Sportiva Mountain Cup that they had um years ago, and the, so that series of races hasn't been a thing in a while. But that was one of the first series that I knew of that like offered prize money, um, and so Heiner was part of it. There was a race in Park City. There was a ra- another they were kind of shorter distance, you know, like, yeah. um, races, but Heiner is a really cool one too. I mean, that's one that I think has like over a thousand people start up and line, like race that event. So it's like huge. Yeah. Mm. That's a good one. <laughs> well, I want to come back to, uh, white face for a second, because you mentioned mm-hmm. that it's about to be the U S mountain running championships. And maybe we can also have a discussion after this about ITRA and all the different Sure. governing bodies in our sport too because i think mm-hmm. you're a good person to talk with talk with about this and even myself as a fan of the sport i try to stay up to date as possible i'm mm-hmm. a little confused so what does it mean when yeah. you say that white face is the u.s mountain running championships so um every year usatf selects a race that will be the u.s mountain running championships um and selection race so they use these events to select the U.S. team that will go to a world championships. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's a bit convoluted, I guess. So I am on the ITRA steering committee, um, which doesn't really have anything to do with whiteface. That is separate. However, I just have, uh, I guess, more knowledge, you know, of how the whole big scheme works. But <laughs> um, so two years ago, ITRA... Uh, World Mountain Running Association and the IAU came together to create one world championship um, rather than a separate world mountain running championship and a you know ultra running championship um, and then a trail championship. So we wanted it all one and that's what we, we have uh, succeeded in. Um, and so the U.S. is using Whiteface as their selection race for that world championship, which will be in Thailand. Um, and it was supposed to have happened now and you know a couple of years ago with COVID obviously everything has um, been pushed back um, and so the USATF uses a system you know like Joe Gray and Grayson Murphy have um, a place on the team already you know from prior wins um, and then there I don't think there's any others that are guaranteed spots yet so unfortunately the folks who were selected for the team last year in Oregon have to re-race this year, which is unfortunate um, because the world championships didn't happen last year. Um, But also sort of makes sense, you know, like you have to select the team for the year. Um, But yeah, so then the USATF uses our race plus, you know, resume um, or other race results, those sorts of things to select the team. But our race will you know, whoever places in our event will be selected for the team and then they have some other spots available. Um, so if you don't come to our race, like you, there's still an opportunity to apply, you know? Um, so from there, the U S team, and I should have pulled up, sorry, I didn't pull up the exact numbers. Like, I think we're sending over 30 people from the U S for the trail world championships, um, which, you know, USATF supplies some funding, you know, that we do some fundraising, You've probably seen it in the past, like I think Trail Butter like did some fundraising for the U.S. team at you know one time, um, and so there's some other ways for them to try to get funds to send these folks. But um, I do believe there is some funding already set aside, you know, for travel uh, and housing and that sort of thing once you you know are selected. Gotcha. And then, so on the ITRA side of things, um, 
we, yeah, we've been working to be recognized by World Athletics um, for a number of years. Like even prior, I've been on the steering committee now since 2019, um, which we can get into that conversation now if you want to, I guess. Yeah, well, w- one question I had on the, um, on the, on the mountain running championships front first is mm-hmm. what distance is, what distance does that go up to? Is it up to 25 K or is it 50 K? So, um, our race is, um, it's like seven miles. Um, and then there, we have the VK as well, but okay. the championship will have several distances. There's a short and long mountain course okay. and then a marathon distance of 42 K and then like a 50 mile ish distance. Um, and okay. so for those types of races, the U S I believe is going to use kind of resume, um, applicants probably to fill like those positions for like the 50 mile race team. Um, mm. I, I should probably know that too. I have held a position on the ATRA board as well. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I should know a little bit better how they're doing that, and, but it's out like, you can find it on their website, you know, the exact, um, how they're going to select the team members. I know like, so for our race for Whiteface, they, um, will take, I want to say it's the top three will be selected for the team. Okay. I think, but well, oh, I should probably look at that. Well, <laughs> we'll link, we'll I, link in the show notes. The yes, exact. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course, of course. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm curious about is, especially with the longer course stuff, like the marathon distance. And I think you said mm-hmm. 50 care, 50 mile distance. Some mm-hmm. of those distances, I think start to conflict with what Spartan has created and what UTMB mm-hmm. has created. Like they're, they're both positioning themselves as, the world championship race for those distances. And, and then you have, you know, groups like uh, IAU and, and world athletics and the world mountain running association. These are like governing bodies. Do you have any thoughts on like the conflicts in branding there and, and what that means for athletes and where they want to like invest their time in events? Yeah. I mean, I think we could have a whole podcast just about this topic. Um, <laughs> Cause it's, I think it's pretty deep and I think, um, I, so being, you know, on the interest steering committee, like I took note of this stuff a couple of years ago, you know, when Spartan started to kind of like be nosing around, um, in these different things. And of course, UTMB, like, uh, I mean, we all know that like Michelle Politi like helped form ITRA. So there was some obvious like reasons why he had to step down as the president, you know, um, yeah. when, little did like we didn't really know though to what extent utmb was going to go you know um when michelle left itra um and that came out after that you know they're sort of spreading that they're doing um but i yeah i'm still a little bit like unsure i guess if i like support or not the sort of like real sort of commercialization that's happening you know of those sorts of things. I, I, on one hand, you know, as an athlete, I think it brings more money into the sport where we can, you know, grow the athletes, you know, and, and for have make a living by trail running. Um, you know, I think when we look at these other big, and I actually read a couple year old posts about like the ultra running league, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, and it kind of like is this right? Like, I wish that somehow we could all like, yeah, agree, right? Like that Spartan Trail and UTMB and ITRA and ATRA and like everybody could kind of come together as this like, you know, but who do you take from each group to like make these choices and blah, blah, blah. But like, I wish there was a way to put them all in a room and say like, you guys, like, no you know if the more we like spread this out and the more like diluted it gets the less good it is for everyone right i i mean i don't know (laughs) it's tough i guess it it would just like for and just to like and this is just a total hypothetical but it would be like i could imagine a scenario where like claire gallagher is on one world championship start line and courtney Mm -hmm. walter is on another world championship Mm -hmm. start line same goes for like Jim Walmsley on yeah. one, Aiden Hawks on another. It's like, 
wait, which one is which, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it totally happens. I think um, the Golden Trip series, for example, uh, last two years ago was going to be real close to the world championships that ITRA and world mountain running had put together, you know, like, so there were certainly going to have to be choices made there by athletes and by sponsors, you know, like Solomon wasn't going to let necessarily pay for any of their sponsored athletes to go to the world championships when they were already expecting them to be at the, you know, golden trail series championship, uh, like maybe a week apart or less. Like it was, you know, like there was a lot of overlap. So yeah, like that's, it does, it's not a world championship in my mind, unless right. Like Claire and Courtney and they're, you know, going head to head. Um, yeah. And so I don't, I think it's, I think it's good for the sport on some levels to like have these, you know, folks coming in that can help to grow it. But I also just hope they do it in the right way, you know? And like, I think part of like why I joined ITRA to begin with was because we all just were diverse population, several different countries represented on the steering committee, but we all, are there because we care about trail running and not losing, you know, the basic values of it. Um, and so it's hard to say like until where these, um, groups take the trail, you know, like where does Spartan trail end up and like, do they lose the values? But I find it probably would be hard considering all those races they purchased are longstanding and have their own values. Right. Like, I don't know. <laughs> well, talking about ITRA now, and just and maybe I can try to describe it in the ways that I understand. You can correct me if I'm mm-hmm. wrong, but ITRA is not a governing body. It's more of an educational slash cultural organization that serves the purpose of taking what's been good about the sport for the last couple of decades and making sure that as the sport grows, uh, newcomers to the sport can appreciate that history and hopefully they're also practicing what's good. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's a a great description. Yeah. Um, And you're very, you're right on the money that like, we're not a governing body. We don't have people that can go out and like, um, go to a race and say, oh, you didn't follow these, you know, like guidelines that you signed, you know, like that's not, (laughs) we're we're not doing that. Right. But, um, but again, maybe that's where we go and have officials someday, right? Like there's trail, there's USATF officials that go to their events. Like somebody needs to create like ultra running and trail running officials. Right. But then it becomes even more like, well, what is trail running? Like sky running has its own definition, right? Trail running actually kind of does have a definition. If you go to the ITRA website, there's sort of like a definition there. Um, right? Like mountain running versus sky running are kind of a different terrain can be on road or trail or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but I think w- one interesting thing about this, I, I yeah, to prep for this episode, I listened to a conversation mm-hmm. between Bob Crowley and Jason Coop, where Bob goes through what interest stands for all that kind of stuff. And one interesting point he mentioned is every single country, I believe that's in the organization has um, not officials, but they're like these educators. It's, it's like mm-hmm. an army of trail running enthusiasts that go back to their local communities and they sort of spread the gospel about what's good. Do you have any, can you give us a sense of like what they're doing on a day-to-day basis and if that strategy is working and. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, they're called um, national representatives and okay. there should be um, at least two, I think in 60 countries. Um, I want to say right now, again, it's on the website, the exact number, but I think there's, you know, typically an athlete representative and then maybe a organization representative because part of what ITRA was created for was for a place that race organizers could also list their event, um, kind of become certified on some level as like a rep, like a reputable race, um, you know, because obviously there could be there's unsafe conditions, right? Like if somebody just decides to put together a race, they don't have aid stations, they don't have medical on staff, they don't, you know, like that's not appropriate. And that's part of what ITRA was trying to prevent, right? Is like, yeah. um, we don't want organizers uh, not knowing how to put on a race. So um, 
Sorry, now I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, we'll take all this out. Don't worry about it. Yeah, take it out. <laughs> well, what's, but, the, what's, what's the opportunity there if we utilize it? Like if we envision the oh, full the national representatives, that's representatives, right. Yeah. What's yeah. the, what's like, what do you see as like the best outcome of their type of work? So um, I guess where I was going with that was that the national representatives are there to also approach their own federations of sport, right? Like within their country. Like I think part of what created um, the national representatives was folks um, like going to, uh, like I want to say in like Portugal, I think was a good example. There was, they went to their federation um, to establish a trail and mountain team. Like there's certainly a lot of countries who don't have athletes represented at like the world championship in trail running because they just don't have a team. There's no organization. There's, you know, so um, some of that was the, you know, maybe an athlete or a race organizer on the ground in a country saying, Hey, there are people who are doing this sport, you know, here's ITRA, here's, you know, some education. Um, and, you know, then we could provide more resources for them about what trail running was. They could potentially create a team. Um, so that's some of what they do, but then also they, you know, are there as a resource for us to be able to write, I guess, spread the gospel of trail running, but also like kind of be an army on the ground of people that um, I think are underutilized, to be honest. And I, you know, I don't think it would mind me saying this. I think, you know, it's a huge resource, you know, having all these people. Um, and I think they're probably a bit frustrated, you know, with the steering committee with us. Um, and part of Part of it is because there's a lot of um, like when, before I joined ITRA, ITRA, I didn't realize kind of the like intellectual property of like having a database of runners, you know, that there's like a million of runners, like information in there about their race placements and like this huge algorithm that tracks them, in, um, which I think yeah. what most people know ITRA for, right, is like the ranking yeah. system. Um, and so it actually is like a lot of work just to kind of maintain that and like be sure that we have the correct, um, you know, like ownership slash like database technology even, you know, so there's like a whole nother like back world to this stuff that I don't think people really <laughs> understand. And I don't didn't understand until I um, saw it firsthand. Now, that being said, it doesn't really you know, make it right that we're not utilizing our representatives well. Cause I, you know, I think, you know, I don't, it's hard to say, like, I think in the, the grand scheme, I guess I should say like, there's big goals of like utilizing them to establish like, um, which I think Bob was big on like a um, uh, runner exchange, right? Like somebody from Portugal comes to the U S to run Western States. They, know they're going to have a, a pacer here and a crew um, and maybe the representatives help to establish those sorts of things, you know, and same, like if I were to go to like, um, you know, Croatia, right. Like to run a race, um, the representative there and, or race organizer can help me like find housing and do all these things. And I think um, it seems like that should be kind of easy to do, but it's not <laughs> to like set up a, you know, a whole system uh, like that. So you know, I think part of why I joined ITRA as an athlete was to help represent the athlete's uh, voice. And like I said before, a lot of the establishing people within ITRA are race organizers, right? So they weren't necessarily thinking about it from the athlete standpoint. And so for, for me, I was, you know, I actually joined um, ITRA. I had broken my ankle that year. And so I wasn't racing. And I was like, got this email in my inbox. I was like, join the steering committee. I was like, great. I have time. <laughs> Why not? Um, and so I did, you know, and as a way to stay more involved in the community, you know, and stay involved in running, um, yeah. even without being able to race myself or train. And so, you know, after doing that, I was like, oh yeah, there's like a lot we could do here, but, and then also there's not a lot of funds, right? Like those, even just holding intellectual property costs money, you know, like it's, um, and there is a staff, like ITRA has staff in France that are paid um, to help with all this stuff. So it's like there are, um, there's not like people searching for grants, for example, for ITRA mm. to like help establish on the ground uh, mm. programs. But I think in the future, like I think for me, youth programming would be pretty key, you know, like with any sport, 
you know, we have to kind of think about who's coming in to replace those folks that are leaving. And so I think youth programming for trail running is would could be huge, should be huge. Um, mm. Another thing that, you know, those representatives could be doing is like establishing a kids trail running program in their country. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I guess I just, you know, want to air my grievances that I feel <laughs> we should be utilizing those representatives better. Um, and I think that there is hope that we can. I think it just takes time and the right people with the, the passion to do it. I'm optimistic in the sense that we, at the very least, have all of these organizations and frameworks to work with and mm -hmm. to build off of. And I think those are really cool ideas too, like the youth level programming and stuff mm -hmm. like that, um, just for like the next generation. One thing I'm curious about, and I think it's been an interesting theme of this conversation, um, I'll say one thing first, and that is I talk with a lot of athletes who are very self-conscious about how selfish their, their running life mm. is. Like they're pretty much only contributing to the sport in the sense that they're putting in the miles for a particular race yeah. and blowing off steam, stuff like that. I think your example is a good one because not only are you an athlete, which we haven't talked that much about yet, but you're also <laughs> a race director and you're involved yeah. with ITRA and all these local community groups. I'm curious where your interest in community involvement comes from and trying to make the sport kind of better than you found it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could also say that's kind of selfish, right? Like it's to stay involved, you know, like to feel like I'm part of something. And I think that's, you know, from like the overall ego standpoint, right? Like sure. we yeah. all want to feel like we belong, right? We all want to feel like we're important and that we're contributing to something. And so for me, um, I found trail running a long time ago, but I don't think everybody finds that thing for themselves. You know, like I remember... Um, seeing a live concert with Rodrigo y Gabriela. Do you know who they are? And I saw them live in Burlington, I guess it was. And I was just like, so like enamored with how they, how passionate they were. And like, you should totally link to a, a video of them playing a live show in the show notes. But it's like, I remember thinking like, I wish I could feel that way about something. Like, I wish I could feel like, just so encompassed and engulfed and like, like in love with it. Um, and then I found running and that for me has become that. Um, and so for, for me, you know, it just makes sense for me to like do these other aspects of the sport besides just actually being an athlete. Um, you know, and like I said, like when I broke my ankle, um, it was a great opportunity, opportunity for me to give back in other ways that, you know, I couldn't run. So, and I had all the, like, I couldn't work as a nurse. I couldn't really do anything for, you know, a couple of months. And so, um, yeah, I decided I'd join ITRA and, and think about some other things, but I, I do think you can still say it's sort of selfish, you know? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But it is, it is interesting to think about ways that you can contribute to the sport beyond just showing up to events and racing and finding mm -hmm. people to train with and, Maybe I'm also curious about this, like if, if there are folks that want to raise their hand and they want to get involved on like yeah. the political side of our sport or the environmental side, like, do you have any recommendations that come to mind either for like local community groups that are common or these bigger national or global groups? Yeah, I think um, like Claire, it's a good example of somebody who's really been into this, right? And like trying to get people involved with like protect our winters. Hmm. Um, so I think there are some really cool examples of people doing just that. Um, you know, I think I gladly say like step up to ITRA if you're like looking, you know, to try to be involved in some way. I've, I've definitely helped had other athletes, you know, in different types of, um, you know, little ad hoc groups that can help as advisors and that sort of thing. Um, and still glad to like work in that capacity with folks if they are interested in, in like trying to put together a youth programming type thing, you know. Um, I think for me personally, like I, um, I think really like when we get right down to brass, tacks, like the more you can do something within your own community or like work with a local trail building group, you know, like I think when you feel ownership for a part of your own community in that way, like when you really yeah. put like dirt <laughs> under your hand and like help do something, um, 
it just makes the world a better place, you know, like it just like butterflies and like spider webs when, when you like are just a good human in your community. Like, I also think it's like probably like the age group that I'm in too now. Like, I feel like it's my turn to like give back to, to, you know, younger folk or like just back to the community. Um, but yeah, I've always had this thought that like, especially with kids too, like, that's why like little paths to school are so important, right? Like they go through the woods because they walk on the dirt. They like create a sense of ownership for the environment or for their trail or for their community. And then it just makes them a better person, you know, overall. And that can just like, it just makes the world better. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me, I read this book, maybe it was back in college. It was called Bowling Alone. And it was mm. about, and there was, there was a ton of stuff wrong in like the fifties and sixties culturally, but it, it talked about how back in the day there were everybody joined like local lions clubs and VFWs mm. and guarding clubs yeah. and stuff. And then because, you know, people yearned for like individualism and uh, independence, they just left and they went back mm. to like their own devices. Mm -hmm. But now there's this thesis that like community is cool again and people are yearning yeah. to like, work together and I see it all around me. And I think that, um, I don't know, I just bring it up because I think that even the trail running community has been affected by that like greater societal yeah. trend and maybe we're going to, you know, the pendulum always swings back and forth and maybe um, what you do will be more common among more runners in our community. Yeah, I think um, for sure. I think that's just sort of, a, you're right, like it's a society, sort of societal and I think with the pandemic and like being so like secluded for so long people are probably like really yearning to have that type of connection um and i think part of that's like right we see all these newer folks that have moved to these rural places too that like how do you connect best you know with your new community um which i think is pretty cool you know i also helped form a group here called the um adirondack community recreation alliance and so we focus on bringing the idea of outdoor rec as an economic booster to your town, right? So like there's tons of tiny, like tiny towns in the Adirondacks that like only maybe see tourists like one month out of the year when it's nice and they, you know, come to canoe or they do something and then they leave. And then um, maybe there's some second homeowners that help keep the tax base going, but that's it. And so we've tried to like, because of course Lake Placid is like the sun, right? Like yeah. everything is like going around Lake Placid, but there's all these amazing like small trails and small communities and mountain bike groups and things happening or like, like ice skating. There's this thing like Nordic backcountry ice skating where you can like go out to like a freshwater lake and just like skate, <laughs> like really cool stuff that people are doing um, that, you know, people from the city or from Boston or like Montreal come here to experience what it's like to be an Adirondacker, right? And like live and partake in what our community is all about. And that's all like, it's all outdoor rec, you know? Um, and so I think like for folks listening, you know, in your own, like, even if you're in a city, right? Like there are trails everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, like Salt Lake is a great example of a place where there's tons of trails and there's like parks and things that you can um, certainly like participate in to further those sorts of places for people, I think. Oh, it's so true. On the adventure tourism front, like going back to yeah. my experience on the AT, um, home, home state of Maine, places like Rangeley yeah. and Monson and Millinocket, like I would yeah. pass through those towns and they'd be like, hey, thank you so much for buying this cliff bar from my bed and breakfast because yep. like all I get for business is the months of June to late August and I'm dry the rest of the year. So like it's every cent counts. So there's a great example. So the Millinocket Maine Marathon, I think it's called. Do you know this? Yes. Oh, Gary. What's it's amazing. Race yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so for folks listening, it's like literally these people decided to establish a marathon in the middle of winter in Millinocket, Maine, where there's nothing. There's, I think, snowmobiling probably brought some money into town, but like old mining town, maybe, or lumber town that like, you know, the, the mill shut down. And so there was no money, you know, everybody left. And so they now there's like, I don't know how many runners they get, but it's like, 
it's big. huge. Yeah, it's, it's a huge the road marathon. Upwards of twelve hundred, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it's brutal conditions. I mean, you're running on like yeah. logging roads. It's like negative ten degrees. Yeah. <laughs> you got Mount and, Katahdin in the distance, though, which is nice. Right. Right. Beautiful. And so you can like, that's like the power of like, an a uh, one race, you know, can like seriously affect a whole community of people. Um, yeah, and I, I just think that's so cool. I think it's like, I just get super jazzed on on that idea that you know one little thing can like totally like bring people together and boost a community in ways that you would never know right like you plant seeds that you just never really see grow but they grow <laughs> yeah well i gotta ask you one last question on this front um if we are attempting to market the northeast as a trail running destination mm -hmm. slash potential mecca um what are some things that you would call out about what makes the region great for adventure, for races, for just being in our community? I think that, um, you know, obviously what's special about here is like our uh, environment is like, I mean, we've got water. Like every time I go out west, <laughs> I just miss the like water and green, um, you know, and so I think that's like just to experience the environment that we have here is pretty special right like um there's nothing quite like the june black flies that we get but like that's kind of an experience in and of itself <laughs> um so i think and but i also think it's there's the again i'm going to go back to community i think that you know people when they come here like to talk a little bit about like the mountain bike scene here um you know on I guess it's Labor Day weekend, right? September, they have a huge mountain bike fest in Wilmington. And, um, you know, people spend the weekend and they like get to experience the, what it's like to live here, you know, and like they bike the same trails that people they get to live here bike. Um, you know, we have a huge bonfire with like, you know, it's basically BYOB in the town park. And it's like, those are the types of experiences I think people are looking for. Like, I don't think they just want to like, I mean, yeah, there's definitely folks that I think, want to go to a community and just check off the list like at a national park that they've been there you know but i do yeah. think there are opportunities in these small towns to like come and experience more than just a you know a checkbox it's you know you meet people and you get to um yeah like kind of challenge yourself because it's certainly not you know i think personally i would say the great range which is kind of our you know like well-known trail mm -hmm in the high peaks is probably the hardest like marked trail in the country. <laughs> and I, I, I accept a uh, challenge <laughs> about that, but I think, have you, have you been on it at all? Ben? The only, the only uh, section of trail elsewhere that I would uh, put up as a contender is the Mahusik notch in mm. Western Maine along the AT. Okay. Yeah. I say that, that I could th see the argument there for sure. Um, but yeah, you're, I think you're spot on, you're spot on. Right. I mean, it's like a literally like it's a it's a marked trail. It's not off trail. These are like literal though, like cliff faces <laughs> that you're like descending or ascending. And it's like, oh, yeah, there's the trail marker down the trail. But it's <laughs> where's that's not a trail. It's just a cliff, you know. Um, so I, I think, you know, coming and having those sorts of experiences are are pretty cool. Let's go to the lightning round here. First question I have for you is do you believe that mountain ultra trail running will be an Olympic sport within the next 25 years? And if so, why? But I'm also curious to know <laughs> if you disagree. I think 25 years is a long window. I think it is possible. Um, I don't think all three, like, I don't think there will be a mountain, ultra, you know, mountain race, ultra race, trail race. I don't think all three will be in 25 years, um, mainly because like we were just talking about, there's so much like overlap slash definition to like be deciphered out of that. And I guess that's one of those challenges that I didn't realize ITRO was taking on. Like when I signed up and I was like, oh yeah, this is very like down to the word of, yeah, are there rocks every two feet? <laughs> you know, like, um, but those are the sorts of things that go into, yeah, deciding on a world athletic scale, what a trail versus mountain run on an Olympic level would look like. Um, and so that's why I hesitate in thinking that it will be, but I do think there will be at least one of those. And it'll probably be the trail race, I guess would be the easiest, right. To like transition from, um, 
or two, I guess, more of like a cross, cross country type feel, you know, um, in a, yeah. So that would be my, my guess. Of course it always, and then it depends on like the host country, right. And like who's applying. Um, yeah. <laughs> and would it be summer Olympics or winter Olympics? I think, uh, so I've done a little bit of snowshoe racing. So it's also like I've done a couple of the world championships, snowshoe races. Um, and so I could see that certainly being an Olympic sport too. You know, they, they're working on their own, there's a whole U S snowshoe association, you know, working on their own thing. Um, and you know, like they support a team and that sort of thing too, you know, and go to the, so, um, that's certainly a bit of a, more of a niche sport, I think, but I also think, yeah. Uh, snowshoeing could be in the Olympics for sure because they're pretty regulated like and we like schema for example so I'm a little bit involved also in an uphill ski coalition here um because Whiteface it has in my opinion to host potentially a world cup in um however we do not have great access to our own mountain because uh the Olympic Regional Development Authority is tasked you know with running those facilities and they are not hugely in support of our uphill program we do have one um it's three mornings a week for two hours and yeah it, it's just you know it, it does that would not you can't train to be an olympic athlete that way you know um so i have my hand in that pot too of trying to like help to get a little bit better access for schema at Whiteface because we have the literally we could have a, a world cup event, you know, I mean, and I think in Europe, Whiteface is still known in the ski world as a world cup level facility. So we would get the athletes. I don't think that's a problem. Um, I think it's jumping the hurdles again of administration and politics. <laughs> Next question. Is there a recent book movie podcast um, album that you've consumed that has changed the way you think? And if so, why? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I'll just say my, like my probably all time favorite musician lately. I, I mean, I could go back to the Rodrigo y Gabriela, like that, that's Which been we'll kind of life changing. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. But, um, Brandy Carlisle definitely is like constant soundtrack for me most of the time. Um, she's like, you know, you have like that song that kind of pops on that you would like play in a cross country road trip all the time. Like definitely Brandy Carlisle's, um, I can't remember which album it was now, but in that, for that 2015, you know, living out of the truck that was on pretty consistently. So again, super current, but I still listen to her all the time. <laughs> And her, her um, memoir is quite good, too. Yeah. read that recently. Cool, cool. Last question I have for you. If you could put a message on a billboard for all to see, what would it say and why? Oh, this is an easy one. It would say believe. And I think most people, it's from well, Ted Lasso. <laughs> All-time favorite uh, show, I think. I've watched it, like, the first season, anyway. I think I watched five times. <laughs> um, but... You know, I think it's like super important to, you know, whether we're talking about like athletics or like just, you know, life in general, like believing in yourself or like believing in the cause or, um, yeah, just keep, keep the belief alive, you know, keep the hope alive. We will have to do a round two at some point because I'm looking at a list of like six more questions I wanted to ask, but... <laughs> Until then, um, if folks want to follow you, if they want to get involved in Whiteface or they want to follow your racing schedule in 2022, uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, pro I guess probably Instagram is the, you know, where I'm most uh, present. And so it's, um, I think it's Sarah Kai's runs, just one word right now. Yeah. And then you're a coach too. I am. Yeah. So I, I, um, with uh, my friend Hillary McCloy, we have a coaching business um, called Eastern Mountain Endurance. So you can find info on there too, if you want. Cool. We'll add the Instagram and the coaching link into the show notes. And Great. this has been awesome. I really appreciate the time. And like I said, we'll have to do a round two at some point, maybe later yeah. this year, early next. And uh, 
actually, yeah. One, what's your, what's your racing schedule for the year? So, um, my plan this year, you know, last year I did hundred mile races that it two, attempted two of them. I did Western States and then attempted run rabbit run, which I only made a little over halfway and ended up calling it quits. But, um, so this year, instead of focusing on those super long races, I, I decided to do some shorter mountain running stuff, like kind of going back to my roots, I guess, of mountain running and short races. But, um, so probably like, uh, which are typically shorter um the spartan elite series which has some pretty cool places like it goes to mexico and um california and canada um and then my a race this year will be the utmb ccc so that's pretty fun I'm psyched for that very cool i'm, I'm yeah. psyched to follow we'll put it all in the show notes and uh thanks again sarah great to meet yeah thanks for having me on